What's going on you guys? Coach Andrew here and today is going to be nuts. It is a Sunday. My wife has gone all day at a conference and my schedule was kind of open. I was just, you know, watching my daughter, but I managed to find a babysitter because an opportunity came up <clears throat> that I really couldn't pass. So one of my personal training clients, Megan, if you're watching this, you're awesome. She and her husband are skydiving experts and um, today they have an extra large airplane with one of the gates that opens in the back and you can kind of just walk out the back of the plane and skydive and she's been trying to get me to go for over a year and skydiving is on my bucket list so basically she invited me to go I didn't really have an excuse I forced myself to find a babysitter and once I got a babysitter I'm, I'm officially out of excuses so I've got about two and a half hours until I'm leaving and uh, I'm a little scared not gonna lie I'm pretty scared of heights I, th I think most most primates are probably relatively scared of heights humans especially now I love roller coasters um, you know I feel safe because I know that they're safe I'm locked in and like I know millions of people have ridden these things and and probably very few have ever been hurt or killed so I know I'm pretty safe the odds are in my favor Skydiving feels a lot different because you're not strapped onto like a metal machine, you know, it kind of depends on the parachute and, you know, you pulling the parachute. There's a lot more responsibility involved. But surprisingly, the statistics for skydiving would say that it's pretty safe. There's approximately 2 million skydives every single year, and on average, the number of fatalities is around 35. So way 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 less than even one percent of jumps i mean like way less than one percent twenty thousand is one percent of two million so 35 i mean you're talking a fraction of a fraction of a percent it's actually way more dangerous to even drive my car to the airfield where i'll be taking off from so <laughs> given that i survived the car ride i should survive the skydive but anyways, I'm trying to find a camera person to film this because obviously I can't just, you know, hold my phone and film it because I'll lose my phone and that's expensive. But um, apparently it's a really busy day at the airfield, so I might not be able to find someone who's willing to film it for me. But I'll do my best and I'll vlog as much of it as I can. If I don't get any actual footage of the jump, I'm sorry because that's, that's what I wanted to do. So anyways, like I said, I've got about two hours until I need to leave, so I'm going to get a workout in and um just pick up my office a little bit i'll uh i'll bring you guys in for the workout before we go jump out of an airplane how does that sound well hey we're down here in the gym now we're gonna get started with our workout soon look at this this is garbage back with 66 percent humidity it hasn't even rained in like a week i don't know why i don't know why it changes so quick so i've got the window open and the door open but like really seriously I don't understand why the humidity down here changes so frequently it, it, it'll do that after really big rainstorms even if the windows are closed and everything the humidity will go up so I'll turn the dehumidifier on and it'll go down after a couple days but I don't know why it's up today and yesterday it was at 16% which is where it usually is but man if any of you can explain to me why the humidity in an unfinished basement like this changes so frequently I'd really appreciate it because stuff rusts. Like, look at these bolts. They're rusting. I don't care too much about the bolts, but sometimes the barbell gets rusty. That makes me angry. But anyways, enough about my first world problems. <clears throat> Here's my training journal. It's brand new as of a couple weeks ago. Now, as you can see, the first page is full. So we are turning the page here. Today is the last day of September. We're definitely gonna do some chest, so we're gonna be doing some flat bench. I'm just gonna do a five by five today. Now typically I would do a five, three, one because I am still on my powerlifting program, but my strength gains so far for the last quarter of the year have been really, really good. And I know that I have another five pound PR in my pocket already. So I'm just kind of playing things moderate and my triceps are super sore from the other day so five by five sounds pretty good to me i just don't want to push anything too heavy um with my triceps being kind of out of the game right now 
My biceps are completely wrecked. My shoulders are wrecked. My back is wrecked. Oh, are we going to squat today? So I'm not actually on a lifting program right now. I'm, uh, I'm just journaling, making sure that I hit each muscle group about two times a week. And kind of just playing it by ear. Every time I come into the basement, I just write down the most ambitious possible workout. And I don't let myself leave until everything's checked off. And it, it works really well. It tends to make me work harder than I would if I were on an actual program. Sometimes the programs, you know, you have to start at a certain level and kind of work your way up to find the sweet spot for that difficulty in terms of weight or intensity. But a lot of the programs that you can put yourself on, you know, that you find online or get from a coach, they have a set intensity and a set number of reps and so the only way to really modify that is by the weight um, and sometimes they tell you what percentages to be doing and sometimes you're wrong so it's the powerlifting programs are really touchy with intensity it takes a lot of fine tuning so I just like this method better because I write down what I do and every week when I do the next thing I just try to up my weight or increase the rep by one or two and I, I just constantly outdo myself and I write it all down to make sure that I'm on top of it. It just works better for me and again a lot of people are different a lot of my clients prefer having something more set in stone and that's that's exactly what we do that's my job. I will be on a program once I get 10 more pounds on my total I'm going to be doing Kai Green's hypertrophy program so I'll tell you guys all about that when I start it. And the ab wheel woo! it's gonna suck today Another set of 20, we'll superset that. All right, lots of compound movements today. Really, between the squatting and the ab exercises, the core is going to be destroyed. It'll be good. And, uh, you know, my body should be functioning at like 50% efficiency by the time I'm walking out of an airplane. So, should be a great day. All right. Let's get started. I've had knee injuries, I've had back injuries, I've had ankle injuries, but believe me, you don't want shoulder injuries. Any kind of injury sucks, all right? And they all have different implications for your health and the future of your training. But man, the shoulder is the key to everything upper body. If you mess up your shoulder, you're gonna regret it. So just do your warm up. I'm choosing to do front squats today, firstly because the last couple squat workouts I've done have been back squats, and I like to change things up every now and then, but also because I'm going to be doing some core exercises later for my abs, and front squats are great at really, really engaging the core. In fact, on certain days when I do a lot of front squats, a lot of volume, I'll find that the next day my abs are really, really, really sore because there's a lot of squeezing, a lot of tension that you have to create in your abdomen and your lower back when you're doing these 
because the center of gravity, the, the center of the bar's gravity is further forward. And so there, there's a tendency to want to lean forward and bend. You'll get a lot of tension in here. Another great thing about front squats, I feel like doing front squats has more of a carryover for my deadlift. So front squats are going to activate more of the quads. It's more of a quad dominant squat as compared to the back loaded squat, which yes, still uses a ton of quads, but there's more of a glute and back activation with that particular exercise. But front squats, they really, really help me with getting the bar off the ground in my deadlift because the initial pull during a deadlift is a lot of quads because you're bent at the knee, you're bent at the hip, and you're just trying to get the bar above your knee. Um, if you watch some of my deadlifting videos on my Instagram page, you'll see a couple lifts where I ramp because I'm so focused on activating my quads just to get the bar past my knee that I sometimes forget or I feel like I'm unable to activate my glutes. And so I end up ramping where I, I kind of pull back and use my quads to finish the lift. In some powerlifting organizations, that's a disqualifier. Um, most of them allow it unless you start hitching, which I haven't done yet on any of my PRs. And I don't want to, um, which is another reason why I do these front squats, because if I can get stronger quads and work on activating the anterior chain a little bit better, I think it'll improve that initial pull on my deadlift. I would like to get better at lifting the bar off the ground quicker. So anyways, that's why a lot of my workouts are focused on the big three, bench press, squatting, and deadlift. Um, just the three biggest compound movements. The big three are the ones that I'm tracking on my PR board here. And um, I'm only 10 pounds away from the 1,000 pound club. I'm, by the way, I'm doing the 1,000 pound club um, not because I want to be a power lifter, not because I want to be the best, not because I'm trying to get as strong as I possibly can, um, I'm actually quite happy with how strong I am. To be honest, I mean, the, the functional utility of weightlifting strength, um, there, is, there is a diminishing return the stronger you get. If you can deadlift 400 pounds, you can squat 200, you can bench press 200, you're going to be able to handle most things that normal life throws at you, right? If you're trying to, you know, throw your kids in the air to play with them, or if you're moving boxes or furniture, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much as strong as I need to be to deal with any kinds of challenges like that that I'm going to be facing in the future. And to me, that's great. It's a nice functional utility to being strong. But I'm not doing it to be as strong as I can. I'm just doing it to prove to myself that I could do it. Because I, I know better than anyone else that I am not the world's best squatter. I, my form is not always perfect. Um, not the world's best deadlifter. Definitely not the world's best bench presser. I struggle with bench press. But I wanted to prove to myself that I could do this. Um, there was a time in college when I thought like I'd never be able to bench 225. Like I'll never deadlift 315. Um, and, you know, and then two years ago, or, you know, just under two years ago, I found out that I have scoliosis. And, um, you know, that really sucked. And it was like, man, my back is messed up. You know, what am I going to do now? And I just, I just wanted to prove to myself I could do it. The 1,000 pound club is one of those things where it's like, once you're in it, you know, like you've, you've kind of proven that you can follow a program. You can, you can be disciplined in your approach. You can track your strength and your numbers and, um, get, get to a point where, you know, you, you hit a milestone like this. It's taken me, it's taken me, if it takes me two more months, it will have been a year that I've been trying to do this, you know, that I've been tracking this and trying to do this, but I'm going to do it. You know, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get into the thousand pound glove. And then after that, I'm going to go back towards more of a hypertrophy style of weightlifting and um, just try to keep adding mass and, and get a little bit bigger. I'd say I probably lift weights more for looks than for strength. But again, they're both awesome benefits. And, um, you know, I, I have some, some body fat that I'd like to lose. I've gained a couple percentage points since I've been powerlifting. And it's not because of the powerlifting, right? I'm not saying powerlifters are, are fat or have higher body fat percentages. Um, it's just, you know, I was eating a lot to make sure that I got enough protein. 
and I gained a lot of weight and it probably, it probably definitely helped me get stronger, but, uh, I'd like to trim back down a little bit. So anyways, um, I'm going to finish up some abs here. Oh man, those are always a burner. My core is fried. But anyways, I just spoke with my client. She's at the uh, skydiving field right now. And uh, apparently they got pushed back a couple times because of the weather. There's a lot of people who want to jump today because they have that special plane. And she doesn't have her GoPro today. So we decided that we're gonna jump next weekend and uh, forego the excursion today. So, I was spending all day mentally preparing for this. <laughs> no, but it's okay, because I'll be ready next weekend. Um, you know, it's, it's like four o'clock right now, and we started planning this at 11, so I didn't really have a lot of notice or time to prepare. So at least this way, I feel like I can put together a better vlog for you guys. And um, I'll definitely have footage of the actual jump, which will be way cooler than just me vlogging before and after the actual skydive. So hopefully you guys will get to see it. You know, you get, get to see me strapped to a dude falling towards the earth at 9.8 meters per second per second. Of course, that doesn't account for air resistance, but pretty fast. Anyways, um, workout's done. So now I have all this time because... The baby's with grandma and my wife isn't home for a couple more hours, so let's see if we can't find something to do. So, <clears throat> anyways, I will be doing the skydive next weekend. I'm going to make sure it gets on the calendar so that it doesn't slip away from me again this year. I'm going to make sure I get it done. But this really makes me think about the nature of opportunity. And I really feel like this year has been a huge year of opportunity for me. There are a hundred different things I've done that normally I might not have done. I might have said no to, I might have been apprehensive, but just because I've been opening my mind up a little bit more and looking for new ways to grow as a person and learn more to be a better coach, I've, I've begun noticing things everywhere. And that this ties into the abundance mindset, which I talk about all the time, it has its own module in my coaching program. But the abundance mindset is basically where you, you convince yourself that the world is full of opportunity, that the world is abundant, that there's plenty of money to go around, there's plenty of happiness to go around, there's plenty of food to go around. And the truth about a lot of these things is that they are abundant. There is enough food on this planet to feed everybody. There is enough money to go around so everyone can live comfortably. There is enough for everybody. The problem is that people have negative attributes like greed and anger and jealousy, and they don't believe in themselves, they have low confidence, and you know, the few end up with more than the many. But if we open ourselves up to these possibilities and we start looking at the world differently, we start searching for the opportunities, even when we don't see them, we start to find them. For example, th the skydiving. I never would have done this. I never would have went out of my way to find a skydiving field, make a phone call, find an instructor, dish out the money to put a time on the calendar and go do it. I never would have done that. I could, but I wouldn't. But it just so happens that one of my clients is a skydiving instructor. So it was super easy. The same thing with going to seminars. I'm going to a really big seminar in New York City in two weeks. I never would have taken the time to Google an online coaching seminar, find someone who's running one, do the research, contact them, pay full price for a ticket and go. But it just so happens that one of my old business coaches had a free ticket. And just by messaging him on Instagram about one of his posts and telling him how much I liked it, he offered me this ticket. So now all I have to do is drive to New York and I get to go to a two-day conference for free. It's, it's abundance. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, you guys. And when you start accepting abundance from the world and from other people, you become so much more willing to give back. For example, I have 
a couple friends who wanted to get in shape. They wanted to learn more about weightlifting. They wanted to kind of fix their eating. And they know that I'm a fitness coach. They started lifting with me in February and they spent a good six months this year coming to my house multiple times a week and lifting with me. And they both lost weight. They both decreased their waist, waist measurements. They both added, gosh, one of them added, you know, over a hundred pounds to his, his total. Um, they've both gotten so much stronger. One of them had uh, his left arm when he would do bicep curls. He'd like pick up 25 pounds, he'd do 12 reps, but by like the sixth rep, his left arm couldn't do anymore and his right arm would keep going. And after a couple months, he fixed it and they're both about as strong as each other now. I mean, just simple things because, because they reached out to me, I reached out to them and you know, I was like, you know, come be my workout buddies. And I got better workouts because I was with my friends, I was enjoying the time with them. I also wanted to look good in front of them because I'm an authority in fitness. So I, I worked harder than I would if I was by myself. It's just a win-win situation for everybody. My cousin and his girlfriend really want to get into shape. Um, they've been trying to lose weight. They've been trying to work out. And, um, you know, they're both really busy. They both just graduated, have these crazy jobs. And, um, you know, he re I reached out to him. I was like, hey, how you doing? How's life? And he's like, it's pretty good. You know, this and that. We caught up. You know, we're trying to lose weight. I said, hey. I'm a fitness coach and you know that, how can I help you? And he's like, well, look, you know, I, he's like, you know, money's tight. I don't want to ask too much of you. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, just, just promise me that if you join this program and I give you the coaching that you need, I write up your program, I give you your meal planning and I give you all the results. Promise me that you'll commit to it. Okay. Because a lot of people I've, I've given away free coaching accounts before to certain people. And I have found that the people who don't pay for their coaching, they never take it seriously. It's, 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 it's very human, oddly enough. When you don't have skin in the game, when you didn't pay a bunch of money for something, you just don't care that much. You know, I, I have found that unless you're paying for the advice or, you know, there, there's something very dear to you that's at risk, there has to be something in the game that's at risk. Otherwise, you just don't pay attention. And and I'm guilty too. Um, one of my buddies sent me his 12 week meditation course and it, it retails at $800 and he sent it to me for free. I didn't do it. I didn't pay for it. So I didn't do it. So, so I looked at, I looked at my cousin. I said, Hey, look, if you guys commit and you give me amazing before and after pictures and we can count how many pounds of fat we burn off, those are, those are excellent results for me. I can use those in my marketing. So, you know, if you promise me that you'll do this, then let's do it. I'll throw you in the program. And, you know, we ended up talking about it and it just so happens that I have been haphazardly trying to learn French, you know, not really trying. I kind of stopped. I gave up. Um, but he's a French major and he has a language mentoring program. So I'm going to bring him and his girlfriend into the coaching program. We're going to get them in shape. We're going to have some amazing results and he's going to tutor me in French which is really cool. I wanted to be bilingual for my kids, honestly. Um, studies show that people who speak more than one language have a little bit more, they have more lights on in their brain. And um, it's much easier for children to learn new languages than it is for adults. So if I can learn some basic French and uh, teach that to my kids when they're toddlers, that'd be awesome. So, I mean, look, again, a win-win situation. All because I'm abundant and I'm looking for opportunities and I'm finding them everywhere. So I guess that's today's lesson. And um, I hope you guys take something from that because it's, it's the honest to goodness truth. So, yeah. If you just approach life a little bit differently and be willing to give and also willing to receive, I, I think you guys will find that there's a lot more opportunity out there than you think. So, anyways. Hope you guys have a good one. That skydiving vlog will be coming at you soon. I am going to do it, I promise. And uh, as always, I'll see you in the next video. Train lively, guys.